welcome back um welcome to week um four week four of the semester um yeah we are well, here we're just about start uh, starting to talk about data cleaning uh, not that we didn't talk about data cleaning all week last week um <clears throat> Uh, next Monday is a holiday, so I have to, or I'd like to at least finish the stuff today that will get you through exercise five. I will be close. So let's get started um, with data cleaning. <coughs> um, I don't think I have any other, if I have administrative stuff, I'll deal with it by, by email or discussion forum or something. Um, Okay. Data cleaning in general, again, it's at, it's at fairly early in the, um, in the data pipeline, which I should just keep open by now. Again, we're, we're, we're sort of in here. Um, <clears throat> it ends up being a big part of, of data tasks. Um, you know, it can be cleaning in the sense of noise filtering that we talked about last week, and it can be a whole lot of other stuff. Um, and you know, like various articles, you know, or estimates, it, it depends, right? Obviously. Um, <clears throat> but like, n nobody seems to estimate that data cleaning is less than half of like real data science tasks. It, it just, data doesn't look like you imagine. And again, like the, a lot of what's happening in this course, because it's a course and therefore, you know, kind of an artificial thing, it, the data cleaning is being downplayed because well, you've got to get on to the next technique. Um, data cleaning is often much more sort of, I don't want to say ad hoc, but like it's specific to each data set, right? Like what's wrong with this data set and the next data set you see, they're not going to be the same. So yeah, you have to kind of figure it out and it's hard to put an assignment together um, <clears throat> that really like sells that. Um, I linked to this Jupyter Notebook uh, from the lecture slides, and I believe it's a, a yet another Julia Evans product. Um, I so I like it. I like it a lot actually. It uses this New York City three one one service request data set. That's like it's out there somewhere. I'm sure if you Google, you can find it. <clears throat> um, so three one one apparently is the number you call if like, I don't know, your garbage didn't get picked up or like there's a pothole in the road outside your house and you'd like somebody to fix it. Like it's that kind of like communicate with the city request line and they, they publish this data set of their calls. Um, and um, she starts looking uh, at incident zip, which is one of the columns. Um, so like an American zip code is like a Canadian postal code, right? It's a some kind of like identifier for like a certain region, rel relatively larger region than a Canadian postal code. Um, but what's happening here is just to start with like read the CSV file with pandas, right? It was, we've seen this, great. Get the data, have a look. <clears throat> There's a column called incident zip and these are the values that are unique in that column. Um, okay, so there's some not a number values because they're missing. They seem to mostly come in as strings and they're like zip codes are, are five digits. Um, so sure, like that, that all seems pretty reasonable until you scroll slightly farther. And, you know, n slash a is a, sure, it's something somebody entered as their zip code. Uh, no clue is also something somebody entered as their zip code. For reasons I don't understand, some of them came in as strings, some of them came in as floating point. It's just mixed values down that column. Some of them are longer than the other ones. Um, that's six zeros, not five zeros, and probably all zeros is not a real value either. Um, okay, so there's some cleaning to do on that data, right? It just, it doesn't look reasonable. You can kind of see what's in there, like probably this floating point number, and if there's a string, uh, one, one, three, five, six, somewhere else up there. They're they're probably really the same value, and for whatever reason, got got it just read as different types for some reason to do with pandas CSV reading. I don't understand. Um, so first thing is like these things that were like no clue and not applicable and zero. Um, sure, good good start, right? To um, okay, I can't scroll on this. Okay, um, you can just say that. You can just say. Here are the missing value values. Turn all of those into the not a number missing value. And you know what? It's a string. Just 
don't try to convert it to a float, just treat this thing like a string. So you can just say that when you read the CSV file, then things start to look at least a little more reasonable. Maybe this is data cleaning, maybe you're still just reading the data, I, I don't know, put it whatever category you want. But then it's still not, mm. so again, almost everything in here is five digits. This one is, is five plus another four. So is this one, this one's six. Um, it turns out, um, again, if you don't know US zip codes, it's the, the dash is almost like a decimal point. So like this uh, 77092 dash something means we're in the 77092 zip code, more specifically the uh, 2016 like sub region or whatever. Um, so in this case where you have nine digits separated by a dash, you could probably just keep the first five and it, then it would look like the other ones. That would be more reasonable. Um, and which I think is where we get through this. Yeah, like sli slice just the first things out. Um, there's a couple more missing values that, that show up. Um, and, oh, right. It looks like in here, like, uh, you know, New York City zip codes seem to all start with ones, right? Like that, that seems to be what we're seeing in here. It, and then there's these weirdos, right? The, the ones that start with a bunch of zeros or the ones that start with a seven or a nine for some reason. Maybe those are just bad data. They should be removed. And I, I feel like I would have gone through the same thought process. I would have thought, oh, it starts with a zero. That's not New York because obviously all New York zip codes start with a one, uh, but apparently not. Apparently, for whatever reason, Central Park is zip code. Like, I don't know if you can mail anything to Central Park, but whatever. It has a zip code. It's 00083. Okay, so that's a real New York City zip code, right? You phone, phone the city and say, hey, there's this thing wrong with the tree in Central Park or whatever. It's in that zip code. Fine. Um, okay. So and again, this is a perfectly reasonable and valid data cleaning thing. Are these other zeros also part of New York City? I guess we should check. Um, but then there's these, uh, so what, 77056, uh, which is here. So I wanted, there we go. That one is apparently in Texas. Okay. That doesn't sound right, right? Like this sounds like obviously bad data. Why would someone in Texas phone the New York city, like pothole and garbage pickup hotline? That it seems like probably a row we should discard and not use for anything. And that's certainly what I would think uh, when I looked at this data. And again, part of the reason I like to include this example is, yeah, but no, actually it, it's, sorry. Um, sorry, I uh, shouldn't have changed my font size there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> these ones that are not in New York City uh, like the, the uh, she subsetted out those just to have a closer look at those data points. And yeah, like, so this one that's, that where the zip code is in Texas. Okay, the person's calling from Texas, but they're calling about, I guess, prob like a collections agency or something from New York who's phoning them. And I guess maybe you can get like non-emergency police stuff happening um, if you call that phone line. Okay, so this is actually perfectly valid, right? Those are, they look weird and they look unusual and they look like they don't belong in the data set. But like somebody from Birmingham, Alabama is being harassed by somebody in New York City. And hey, could the police maybe go by and ask them to stop or whatever's going on here? That is a actually perfectly valid and correct zip code. And the only reason that we know that is we looked closer at the data or Julie Evans looked closer at the data on our behalf. Um, Data cleaning is hard and data cleaning is often very ad hoc because it depends on what's going on in the data. And it can depend on what question you're asking, right? Like if, if the question here is where should we, uh, again, I, let's say road crews, right? People who fix potholes and people who phone this phone line are asking about pothole fixing very often. Where we, if the question is where should we put more road crews? Well, not Birmingham, Alabama. Right. If, if that's your question, this is a data point you should throw away. It's just not relevant. But it is a valid representation of information to do with this record. Um, how you treat it is going to depend on what you're doing with this data. Um, and that's just one column 
out of all, like, I don't know what else is in this data set. Like that's one column out of one real data set takes that much work to try to understand. And then of course, even to know what you're supposed to do with it, it depends on the question you're asking. And that's a very real thing. <coughs> um, things that you might find, and obviously this is not a definitive list of things that might ever be wrong with data, but it's a good start. Um, duplicate or missing data, um, just like inconsistencies. Uh, boy, if human beings are entering strings, um, human beings make spelling mistakes or hit the wrong key when they're typing. It's just a thing that happens. It's okay, but it's in the data. You have to deal with it. Um, yeah, synonyms, formatting, all of these things that just real data, ha this happens. Um, and you have to deal with it before you can do any real serious analysis that you thought was what you spent all your time as a data scientist doing. But a few things that I think are worth mentioning because they kind of come up. Um, is the data just straight invalid? Um, so maybe it's missing. And we saw in that, that Jupyter notebook, um, uh, I guess they're, oh no, the, the missing uh, zip codes. And you know it might be valid to um, the things that are outside New York City, um, wherever they are in here, wherever they're handled in this code, um, it might be valid to take the things that are outside New York City and replace them with the, the not a number missing value because, well, yeah, they're there and they are a valid zip code, but they're not a valid zip code in New York. And again, depending on your question. Um, Again, there were things in there that were strings, effectively. Like you expect a five digit sort of thing and the n slash a is not one of those, uh, it just isn't the right data type. Um, and then there's a more sort of semantic question about you know real thing. Just because you have a column called length and that column is numeric and lengths are numeric, well, uh, you know, my limited understanding of, of the term length, uh, I don't think negatives uh, are valid. And you know, I don't think February 31st is a valid day. Um, or in like in the North American dialing system, anything with three fives in that middle location is not a valid phone number. Um, they just don't assign those numbers. Uh, they're reserved for like saying it on TV because you don't want to say somebody's real phone number on TV or whatever. So I know that's not a real phone number that you can phone and talk to somebody only because I know this quirk of the North American phone number um, scheme. Um, you know, so sh should I throw those away? Um, again, e either throw the records away, replace those, those with a, a missing value flag. Um, it depends, but maybe, probably. Um, and it's going to depend on what I'm doing with the data. Um, one of the things specifically that comes up when you're looking at sort of bad data or incorrect data are outliers. Um, fundamentally, an outlier is just a data point that's not very much like the other data points. Um, it's, it's just size is much bigger, much smaller. That doesn't mean it's a bad data point you should throw away, but it might. Um, this, I, like I promise this really happened. <laughs> I, I didn't even have to run the code very many times. Um, okay, so I did this, and again, in the way that during lectures I'm making up fake data just because it's kind of easy to, to test the code out and show you what happens, this is obviously perfectly valid, randomly distributed on a normal distribution data because that's exactly how I created it. I can see it right there. I don't usually get that. I don't usually know exactly the distribution that, that these samples were drawn from. Here I do. Mean of zero, standard deviation of one, a, th a thousand normally distributed points from that. So. When I do this, when I take the data set, I have a mean close to zero, a standard deviation close to one, and a min and max. Sure, this is pretty weird, right? Like when if you sample a thousand data points uh, from a standard normal distribution, getting a data point that's four standard deviations away from the mean, which is what that one is, is weird. That that's not an expected thing to happen. So I can do a I can do a plot. Like I can see that on a plot and I can see it's way out here, hanging out, totally unlike any other data point, it is an outlier. That that's, I mean, there's, there's formal definitions of outlier that I don't really care about. This one's far. And I think sometimes people learn the word outlier and immediately think, oh, I should delete outliers from my data set. Well, no, like look, that data came 
from the same distribution as all the other data points. It's a perfectly valid sample from that distribution. Just because you think it's kind of weird doesn't mean you should throw it away. Or like, I don't know, if we're measuring people's heights, like uh, who's a tall, like Shaquille O'Neal has a height that is an outlier. It is several standard deviations away from the normal distribution of human heights. He's a guy with a real height. Like that's a valid measurement. Um, you tell him his height's not valid if you don't like it, but you can't just exclude a number from the analysis because it kind of looks a little funny. It's not how the game is played. Or maybe you should because it's actually a, an invalid data point. It was a measurement error. It was a, a recording error. It was a, a measurement of a thing that isn't actually in the group that you're trying to measure or whatever it is. It depends. Depends on the data and where it came from, and hopefully you know. Um, some made up data that, well, I, I made up before I gave lectures from a spare bedroom, but <clears throat> maybe this, it feels probably warmer than 21 just here at the moment, but you know, maybe they have this sort of situation in the house. Um, okay, this is a really weird measurement. Uh, this is a, a, a measurement unlike any other temperature I measured in my house. Well, probably, probably that's not real. I mean, it's a real measurement of some air temperature possibly, but probably what I'm going to do with this data is make some decision about like, you know, home automation and turning on the air conditioner. Um, in which case this, I, this is not the, the problem. Or, you know, maybe this number is an outlier. You know, I get, I, if I had a bunch more data, I only have four data points on the, on the slide, but maybe I have a bunch more data and I realize that the like desk surface right down there is much hotter than everywhere else in the house. Maybe that's because my hand is sitting on the desk. Maybe it's because there's a computer underneath it. Maybe because it's this room is kind of hot. Uh, who knows? Uh, again, it depends where the data came from, how I understand it, um, what I'm doing with it. So you can, you can definitely identify outliers. That's really easy. You can look at a number and say, oh, it's this many standard deviations away from the mean. It is an outlier. Um, but that doesn't answer any questions. Um, I actually looked at this this Wikipedia like intro paragraph. It's pretty bang on, uh, right? Yeah, an outlier is a far away data point. Um, but why why is it there? Um, might be measurement. It might be just a funny data point that's real. It might be an error. It might be something you should exclude from the data analysis or the data set before you do the analysis. But who knows? Um, um, were there other, no, okay. And there's probably other examples in there, but you don't want to watch me scroll a Wikipedia article. Um, <clears throat> so if you want to understand your data, plot it. Like, I don't think there's any question. Um, if you have a data set you've never sort of worked with before, you've never encountered before, you, you don't really understand, plot it. Um, have a look. <clears throat> so like in exercise two, there were outliers and we excluded them. Um, should we have done that? Um, I don't, wait, when I'm, <clears throat> so I'm recording this before exercise two. Um, but I'm going to predict that nobody asked, right? I, I don't think uh, next Wednesday in the lab, I'm, or last Wednesday in the lab from your perspective, I guess. Um, I'm, uh, I don't think I'm, I'm going to be answering a lot of questions of like, well, but why? Why did we exclude that data point? What was it for? Should we have kept it in there? Um, and then we excluded it because I looked. I looked at those data points. So I can see they're really weird on the plot, right? There's no question when I draw this scatter plot or I thought I had, no, I didn't. Okay. Um, there's definitely like there's these five, six data points that are definitely weirdos. They're definitely unlike all the other data that is now smashed down here. It's all like one pixel high. Um, if you looked, um, this is a dog that is rated 1776 out of 10, and it's got all like stars and stripes, you know, 4th of July, America, yay stuff on it. Okay, well, 1776 is American independence. Is that a real rating? Not really, right? Like, it's not like 1776 dog is 100 times better than a 17.66 dog. Um, that would be down here. That's not, this is a, it's a joke in numeric form that happens to look like the ratings that we're looking at in this, in this analysis. 
And then there's, uh, I think it's a Halloween 666 dog and a couple of 420 dogs. Um, I don't remember the one around 200. Anyway, again, I, I think it's perfectly reasonable to look at those ones that are up there and say they're not real numbers. Like they're not re real, like comparable to the other numbers in this data set ratings of dog cuteness. Um, <clears throat> so this is what you got, or I, 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 I think my slides in the assignment data set of diverge but whatever something like this um you know there's still a few data points here that are definitely unusual and maybe deserve a look right is this one at 16 or 17 or whatever it is um are they real are they you just really especially cute dogs and therefore valid ratings or, or something else it, it might be worth a look and again the ones down here at a zero or one out of ten um <clears throat> I don't remember. Uh, I think one of them was a like a skunk or something like something that was like a non dog. So the question then becomes, well, what are we doing with this data? Do we keep the the rating of the the skunk or the penguin or whatever the heck it was? Um, I, 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 oh, so what's our question? Um, our question is, is like, is there grade inflation in this rating? Like, has it been increasing over time? Well, how did I phrase that sentence? I said ratings. Okay, so these are ratings. Um, maybe if I'd phrase that sentence of, are the ratings of dogs increasing over time? I should exclude those because they're not ratings of dogs. Um, it, it depends. And again, it depends how I'm thinking of this data. And this is obviously not a real serious data set. So I'm not sure there's a really serious answer about what to do with these data points. But you know, if, if this was an, an analysis I was doing, I, I have to just make that call. We made that call. Um, well, I guess I made the call on the exercise because I just said, oh, do this and this and this with the data. Um, you, again, I predict mostly, didn't look. You just did the thing the assignment said and didn't really take the time to look and understand and get a feeling for the data. Or maybe you should have. <coughs> oh, there it is. Um, yeah, this is a box plot of the same thing. Uh, where the box plot is, uh, I'd have to check the docs. Like It's, it's something like the median and the 20 the 25th and 75th percentiles and then like 5% and 95% and then dots past that. I, I I don't go for a box plot very often. Like I, I would much rather take the the um, scatter plot if I have two dimensional data or a histogram if I do have only one, uh, one dimensional data. <clears throat> and again, I think I see here, like if, I, so this is basically, if I ignore the date, the X axis in this plot, and I only have the ratings, I would probably visualize it this way. And I can see pretty quick. Um, yeah, if there's something weird going on here, right? there, my, the scale of my graph is getting stretched so that all the real data or as many, as much of the real data as I can see in a single pixel is all in one bar and then something's, and then after I exclude, it still looks funny. I still see like, there's definitely some very small bits of data out here on the edges that again, maybe I keep, maybe I don't, maybe I should look at that, right? It's, it's easy enough in, um, it's easy enough in pandas to do. You would say something like, um, um, I do this filter. Um, well, where do I start caring about it being weird? Um, maybe I look at the, you know, the ones, the ones greater than 14, maybe those would be interesting. And the ones that are less than about four, maybe I should have looked at those data sets. Um, like these, these like filtered versions of the data frame to see what's going on there. Maybe I would have learned something and I would have, um, Again, made, made some intelligent call about what to do with that data, which again, if this was a more serious analysis, I guess I should do. Um, and I guess, yeah, the other thing, right, like, because, because what we did with this data was a linear fit, and it's a, it's a, a sum of squares error fit, these outliers are going to drag that best fit line, right, because if, if we, if you do a line that would be basically horizontal on this visualization, the squared error to this data point is massive because it's so far away. Um, yeah, outliers would completely destroy any other trend that we have in that in that data set for that analysis so we removed and we removed them again not because they're far away and we don't like data that's different than other data 
We remove them because they're not really valid ratings of dogs, and we're looking at ratings of dogs. <coughs> um, so when we found we took that approach. We just um, said, yeah, yeah, just just those go. They get they get thrown away. Um, again, maybe you see an outlier. And again, it, it's, that would be something like in the visualization, those points that are way down at the bottom. Maybe there's just a really ugly dog in there. I don't know. In which case, yeah, that's a rating of a dog. We're looking at ratings of dogs. It stays, even though it's a f f way far away outlier. Um, maybe instead of removing, removing the, the row, you, you just remove the cell effectively, which I think like what I might have proposed for things like in this zip file stuff, these things, right? Like this is still a real thing that happened. I might still want to count the number of harassment calls versus debt, not owed calls or whatever. And then they're real, but I maybe would take this zip code as like, yeah, yeah. But when I'm looking at geographic arrangement of problems, I care about things that are in the city, not things that are out of the city. Maybe in that case, I would have done that. Um, Maybe, uh, probably not in either of the data sets that I'm talking about right now, I would impute. <coughs> um, imputing is effectively like replacing a value with a calculated, like reasonable value to put in that spot. Um, you almost certainly shouldn't do this. Um, except when you kind of need to do this. Because um, if you're calculating a, a number and putting it into your data set, you're just taking your own idea about what the data should look like and like enforcing it. That's almost certainly a bad idea. Um, you're going to make like something not real is going to be in your data and you're going to then treat it like a real data point. But maybe you have to. Um, so the things you can do there. May, it's it's probably an average one way or another. And it might be just like um, a mean substitution is basically, I need to have a number here. I need to have a number here because otherwise the, the next, the calculation I'm going to do next is going to throw an exception. I'm going to put the most boring number possible here and hope that it doesn't throw off the rest of the results too much. Um, <clears throat> so that might be common in like a machine learning kind of context where you need the data. And if you just put the average, the mean in that spot, you're sort of saying like, well, there's nothing interesting about this record or this um, column for this record. This one cell is like boring, kind of hopefully it doesn't throw off the rest of the stuff, but you can use every all the other columns for that row for the, whatever calculations or basically some other calculation of reasonably plausible value for that spot. Um, <clears throat> and again, you should almost certainly never do that. But like, I think I can, I can create this plausible-ish scenario. Um, you know, there's a, a, a data is being recorded every minute and maybe this is just a person there's just a person with a with a clipboard sitting there and every minute they record the x and the y whatever those are and then all of a sudden the thing happened right all of a sudden the the values went from four or five hundred all of a sudden they dropped and the person was really excited and they forgot to record the time um i don't want to throw away that record just because this number is missing because this number is really important but I think I could pretty fairly estimate what number is supposed to go there, even though it's missing. I'm going to bet it's 1425. Um, you know, in some sense, that's imputing, right? I am calculating fake data based on some trend that's happening in this column, but in a way that I think, let's me keep this row, let's me have a valid value there, um, and then continue with the calculation, not throwing away the really cool thing that's happening in that record. Um, this is a made up example and contrived, I will admit, but I, I think, well, hopefully at least you take my point, right? Like there's times when it's just like, I, I need that number to be there and I'm pretty sure I know what should go there to have it make sense. Or I know that if I put a reasonably plausible number there, the rest of the calculation, it's not really going to, it's not going to cause any problems, but these other numbers get to stay and I want those other numbers there. <coughs> it, it can happen. Um, maybe, and I had a, I had a student suggest this, uh, point that 
sometimes it's the fact that the number is missing that's important where um i don't know you have some sensor and it's collecting humidity or something and uh, what happens a lot is like the humidity goes up a lot and then the sensor disappears uh, but the sensor disappears because that humidity was a thunderstorm and then the power went out right maybe just the missing versus not missing is an interesting fact when it comes to some analysis you're about to do or some machine learning process or something and yeah like i'll take that as uh, again it's not going to happen in every data set but yeah definitely plausible uh like i said when i did it noise filtering is like I, in my mind at least part of the data cleaning i did it so you could work on exercise three mentally insert noise filtering slides <coughs> Or um, another kind of like removing weird junk from data. Um, that I, at least I'm going to talk about it as, as a part of data cleaning. It's a big topic uh, to do entity resolution. And this is, I guess, if you, I mean, you know what hopefully a join is um, like you did in uh, exercise two to get the like day one versus day two for the same uh, Wikipedia page together. Like that's a that join operation of join on the page title is fine if you have the exact same string in both data sets. Um, you know, the, these two strings refer to me usually, I guess if we're at SFU, um, but they're different strings, right? If you're just doing a mechanical string comparison, those two things are not equal, but there's this underlying entity, me, um, that is referred to by both of them. Or again, I have two records and I want to link them together. Like those, those are the terms that kind of get used in this spot. And if you have any kind of like human generated data, this becomes a problem, right? So like I, I grabbed this one. I think these are the same product, right? I think AMD Ryzen 5 5600X 6 core 12 thread unlocked desktop processor with a stealth cooler. And I'm not going to do it. You read that to yourself. I think those are the same product. I think this price and this price are comparable numbers. I think because I have some sense of how like CPU model numbers work, but do you, how would you ever decide? Like if you were trying to do this in some automated way, if you were like PC part picker or something, how on earth would you possibly decide that this string or this URL or this string or that URL refer to the same product and that you can <clears throat> you know grab those two prices and put them beside each other and compare them um who knows <clears throat> um what you really hope is that the world is organized so you don't have to right this is why you have a student number and i have an employee number and they're actually the same number at sfu um it's because if nothing else, there's something you can write on your midterm and therefore have some assurance that you're going to get your mark and the next student beside you is going to get their mark. And just because you have similar names, we're not going to mix them up. And fundamentally, it's an entity resolution problem that's being solved by having this unique identifier. Um, you know, like this one, had, like I noticed in, in the product description here, I saw this string. So I went over here and I scrolled and scrolled and scrolled and I found the same string here. Okay, so maybe, at least in this case, an Amazon part number, if I can get to that string and uh, Canada Computers model slash manufacturer part number, maybe I can use that field to resolve those two things. But I bet if I clicked on two more products, they would have different strings in those because they're probably used inconsistently by different sellers or manufacturers or whatever. Um, you, you kind of just hope you don't have to do this. Um, <clears throat> if it's a question of, of spelling mistakes or typos or something, maybe a, an approximate string matching algorithm will, will get you there. Um, the entity resolution that you uh, have done, what week is it again? <laughs> will do at exercise four is uh, like geographic based. It's it's a question of like, what's the closest? Um, you know, the, this record here and this record here, find the closest ones to each other and say that those are the same 
city. Um, or like, you know, if you have like two databases of stores or retail locations or whatever, and you find two things with the same name and they have a different address, but those addresses are like within 12 meters of each other, you could probably imagine those are the same store, but it's going to depend on the data set and what you're doing with it and everything else and what data you have to work with. Um, so again, hard problem, um, I guess, but in the specific case you're working with and whatever data you're imagining may be possible. All right. Um, one note of just like, if the data you're trying to get your hands on is a string and there's a sort of a little bit of structure there, and this is exactly what we saw in uh, exercise two, sorry, de uh, dealing, yeah, 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 the pop inflation business, um, here, um, <clears throat> is a regular expression is, is fundamentally a pattern um, that may or may not occur in a string and a way to, to find that pattern when it does occur. Um, so yeah, if you have a, some, a little bit of structure and we had the number slash 10 structure and we knew we could go looking for that, or, you know, you might have in a web page something like part number and then like new table cell and you can find it over there or again somewhere you can find that string or something like that. That's that's the idea here. <coughs> so um, as is going to often be the case here, there's sort of like basic data analysis stuff. There's like the more pandas way or the more Python way. Um, the more pandas way to apply a regular expression to a column of text is the str.extract. Um, so what you do here, why am I looking at the, over there for an example? There's one right here. <laughs> um, I have a column series in pandas. It's a string column. And in the str object or whatever it's called, um, there's an extract method. The extract method takes a pattern, like a regular expression pattern, and some stuff I probably don't care about, and returns the groups. Okay. So this regular expression, and this this is the regular expression. Um, <coughs> so the R prefix on a string in Python is a raw string. Um, basically that means that the backslash is not special. So in most Python strings, like backslash n means new line character. In a raw string, backslash n means two characters, the backslash and then the n. Uh, backslash has come up a lot in regular expressions, so that it's just a common pattern to use a raw string to represent them. Um, and then this is the actual pattern. And this is the letters VOT followed by either the E or the ING. So voting or vote, uh, space for space, and then whatever, whatever follows. So this is a way to, uh, the, again, the imagined scenario here is I have a bunch of tweets and I want to find out what people are saying about who they're voting for. I'm voting for this person, I'm voting for that person, whatever. So voting for, vote for, and you hope that you can extract that string and then in the next step make sense of it. That, that's a sort of scenario here. And of course, there's nothing that means that, there's no reason that pattern has to exist. If it, does, if it doesn't, you get some kind of marker of missing data. <clears throat> the more Python way to do it is to like create the regular expression object of course, you want to create the regular expression object once. It's probably expensive. There's a parsing step. I, I don't want to put this line in the function because then I'm doing it once. I'm building this object once for every row, and that's heavy. Um, but this is a, a normal Python function. Apply it to each row, whatever the function returns, put it in the spot. Um, so I guess, oh, the, the, so the thing I haven't mentioned here, the um, and it, it's on a couple of slides, but the parentheses are match groups. So, uh, you know, it's, it's the what substring is matching this part, what substring is matching this part. Um, in pandas, this is zero and this is one. I want one. I don't care. I don't care which it which it is e versus ing. I care about what follows the word for. Over here, it's the match group, and they're they count from one in Python because whatever. Um, but so this is group one and group two. I want group two. Um, 
And I guess in Python, if the string doesn't match, you get a none here. So if the match is truth-like, um, exists, it yeah, if else return that. Um, same kind, of, same kind of operation again. Different, different way to get there. I'm not highly um, attached to one or the other. Um, so the way you express a regular expression, like I mean, it's not a, it's not a string process, of course. I'm not too worried about regular expressions, but I do think you need to know some basic stuff about them. They're just such a handy tool to have in your toolkit. Um, like I said, the the R prefix is about raw strings. Is the is the backslash special or not is really the only question there. Usually in Python, backslash R is return, backslash T is tab. In a raw string, they're just characters. The backslash is just a character. It is what it is. Um, like I said, if I'm if I'm in, especially if I'm in Python land, I want to create this regular expression object once because again it probably it's got to take a lot of work you've got to parse that string into some kind of parse tree or whatever and then it has a dot match method that you can use to say well first of all does this pattern occur or not that's the first question or i guess does the pattern occur at the start of the string or does the pattern occur anywhere in the string i can tell you right now every time i use a python regular expression it's just 50 50 uh, every time I pick one at random, and about half the time I'm right and half the time I'm wrong, I I have some very specific learning disability that is like I cannot remember which one is which between those two. Apparently, my slide says matches at the start of the string and searches somewhere in the string. So in a regular expression, <clears throat> most characters just match themselves, right? So here or like back here where I have like this VOT is just, I literally want those characters, lowercase VOT. Um, dot matches anything. Uh, if, if you do want to escape something, and this is why backslashes come up in regular expressions. If I say dot, I mean any character. If I want to actually match a period character, I have to say backslash that. Um, the star means zero or more, the plus means one or more, the question mark means zero or one of those. Um, and in fact, maybe I'll, if we look at this. Um, so it just ignore the parentheses for now. Um, this is some digits. Uh, well, I guess we need those parentheses because this is an optional thing. So some digits followed by maybe a, a decimal part, a fractional part, right? So it's maybe this is like 12.01. So maybe there's a 0 0.01 type of thing in there. Um, so, sorry, I flipped one slide too early. Uh, backslash D is digits. <laughs> um, sorry, so one or more digits, maybe point some other digits, maybe not, maybe it's just 12 slash 10. Um, so that, that's what's being expressed there, if we don't worry too much about the parentheses yet. Um, yeah, so the, yeah, there's an optional part there, and there's a literal um, period. If there is a fractional part, it will start with a dot. Um, start of the string, end of the string, if you do want to be sure you're starting and ending where you, where you thought. Um, the square brackets are one of these characters so sort of whatever characters are in there um any one of them and of course the the plus here is one or more of those um but yeah much more common like backslash d for digits backslash lowercase s for spaces or uppercase for non-spaces um so this is a way to say like yeah i have, I have a number looking thing or i have some kind of like word separator kind of thing um that that's the idea there um, so like this, like this is going to be common in a case like this, where I have some kind of structured text. You hope it's more structured than like a tweet. So this, like a log file that comes out of, um, Nginx or like some web server, it's going to look like this, but more, this is a much simpler, much simplified version, but you can kind of see what's happening here, right? There's like an IP address and a space and a quote and the word get, maybe there's some other word that could go there, another space and some stuff and 
like, like I kind of see there's a structure here and I'd like to kind of, it'll, I presumably like to get at it if I'm, if I'm looking at this data file. Um, so the pattern that I put together that I think matches this pretty well. So start of the line is a carrot and a line is a dollar sign. And I guess I know, uh, like I'm, I'm going to have between zero and three digits there because that's how IPv4 addresses work. But I just said some digits, dot, digits, dot, digits, dot, digits. So the, the dotted quad, like four period separated integers. Fine, good enough. A space and the word get and a space and I don't know, some stuff. Like the, again, the capital S is not white space. So I don't know, whatever it is, it's, I mean, it's a path part of a URL which cannot contain spaces. So that seems like it'll probably match that part. HTTP slash and like digit dot digit and then some more digits out here. And then the, the line ends. So, okay, like that seems, seems like it probably matches the base, at least on the three examples I can see on my slide. Um, maybe there's more going on. Like maybe if we turn on IPv6, th that can change. Uh, maybe there's some other word that can go there. Maybe there's like HTTP 10.0, in which case I need more than one digit in that spot. But you know, I'm probably getting there. Um, I think it's, I think this is pragmatic. Even if you think you know, every line will match this pattern. If it doesn't, just fail fast, like fail right away. Don't don't get 10 lines of code later and then realize something's missing. Just, just check like, hey, I think this pattern is going to match this line. If it doesn't panic and tell me what's wrong and help me out here, let, let me get to a, a reasonable resolution. Um, the parentheses are, uh, like I said very quickly there before, match groups. So everything in the parentheses, when the regular expression engine matches the string, it will also capture the parts that are in parentheses like that. Um, so again, in the Python style, they're, they start at one. In the uh, Panda style, they, they count from zero, whatever it is you're doing. So again, in pandas, this will be group zero is the IP address and group one is the presumably uh, path of the HTTP request. And group two is the um, status code, right? That was like four, 200 or 404 or something. Yeah. I imagine that's what I would call those if I was thinking about web logs. Um, so you end up with something like this to take a text file that is very highly structured and turn it into data. like. You know, I probably still want to do a type conversion. I probably want to like put it into a data frame or something. I've just printed it on the slide, but this is this is a way to sort of pull some of that structure out of your data and get going so you can then do some more next. Maybe that's an ETL step. Maybe you think of it as data cleaning. I'm not I'm not highly like I don't really care what category you put it in. It's a tool that's useful. Um just because you have a string, don't think you need a regular expression. Like if you're, you, it is not possible to parse HTML with regular expressions. Don't try. Use an HTML parsing library for that, for example. Um, so uh, I think I have no choice but to take a break there, and I will come back uh, talk about some stats. See you in a few minutes.